Good afternoon and welcome to another live stream here on DreamBank's Facebook page. My name is Andy Frisky. I'm a senior dream curator at DreamBank. Really excited to introduce this DreamBank veteran speaker we have today. But before I go ahead and do that, we'd like to welcome everybody who may be tuning in for the first time. We'd love to give you a little bit of context as to who we are and why we are here. So DreamBank is a free community resource um, that is put on by American Family Insurance. We are dedicated to helping uh, inspire people to pursue their dreams. And in large part, we do that through the programs that we offer. So at DreamBank, we have 11 different event series that appeal to as many different dreamers as, as possible. Um, anything ranging from a business-related event series, career-related event series. We have events in Spanish, uh, family-related activities, crafting series. We also have a Dream Big series, which is an inspiration motivational wellness speaker series. So again, really trying to uh, cover the gamut in our offerings. If you're curious about some of the future offerings and you're viewing this on our Facebook page, go ahead and press that events tab. That'll give you a good concise list as to what we have in the upcoming months. We do right around one event a day. So um, keep, in, keep an eye out for, for any sort of future events. In addition to the future events, we've been doing uh, virtual events pretty much since the end of March 2020. So if you want to go back and watch the library of events that have already taken place, there's lots of great nuggets in there. Um, I'm really, though, excited to, to uh, kick it over to our featured speaker today, Deborah Biddle. Deborah has spoken on a, uh, a myriad of topics, including uh, the, the one that she's about to, to shed with us here today. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Debbie. Debbie, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited to talk to you about a little bit more about training and how you can have an inclusive, um, engaging training scenario at your organization. Um, today, I'm going to have a time at the end where I'm going to take questions. Um, I don't know if Andy said this already, but I'm just going to say it again. So um, if you have questions, put them in the chat and I'll look at them at the end and try to answer all of them. But we'll have an ask me anything time after I get done talking a little bit more about training. So I'm having some issues with my, let me try to get this up again for you. All right, so what we're going to do is talk about creating actionable DEI experiences. So one of the um, first things I want to ask you or pose the question I want to pose is why is diversity equity and what is diversity equity and inclusion training? We hear of a lot of different things that people call DEI training, everything from anti-harassment training to emotional intelligence, to microaggression, to conversations about DEI. So what, what is it? One definition is that it does range from very basic awareness activities like just explaining concepts around what does diversity mean, what does equity mean, what does inclusion mean, to actually building valuable diversity and cultural skills. So it could be helping you to become a more competent leader when it comes to engaging employees from different backgrounds or helping you understand a particular aspect of culture, whether you're learning about um, people in different racial or ethnic backgrounds, or people in the LGBTQ community, how to engage each other with more empathy and compassion. All of those things could be in the realm of skill building. Um, the success of DEI training really is impacted by how effectively organizations give their employees the right tools and the right supports. So sometimes we just give folks a lecture and we just send them on their way and expect for them to have grasped all the things about DEI. That doesn't always quite get it. We need to have more support and it needs to be part of the fabric of the everyday existence within your organization. So we're looking at ways to train people that really helps employees develop along the way and actually shows up as an improvement in their performance in terms of how they engage one another. Um, the benefits of, of DNI training, we'll talk about a little bit later, but they, they range between mere um, civil profit, uh, productive engagements to actually helping teams be more profitable, more productive, and more proficient at what they do. Um, 
one of the impacts or the benefits of diversity training is that it might help your organization minimize any kind of legal risk should there be any kind of diversity-based discrimination in the workplace, whether it's um, sexual harassment or harassment based in some other form, based on someone's identity, um, helping to raise the level of awareness and competency among employees should help to re reduce some of the risk associated with that. So one thing to know is that when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, training and hiring are never the total solution. Diversity training and, and minimal hiring places can lead to, to tokenization. So we have to think a little bit beyond that. It's about our culture. It's about our lived experiences day to day. And when we just say we're going to have more Black, Indigenous, and people of color, they become kind of like the raisins in your organization's white oatmeal. You know, it's just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it's not really true um, inclusion. It's just a sprinkling so that it looks a little bit different and it tastes a little bit more palatable, but it's not true inclusion. So it only if you, if you take that approach, then you're looking at it to say it only takes a few for it to taste richer, to be more palatable. And that's, that's not where we're heading. We're not really trying to be a more palatable organization because society is putting pressure on us. But we really want to have a place where people can thrive no matter where they come from. And so when you're talking about your training and your hiring for diversity, it has to pack a little bit more punch than that. When we look at it, we look at the overall structure of your organization. Um, just moving a little bit, talking a little bit outside of the training realm, think about your organization holistically. Who is it that leads? What kind of background do they have? Is there racial diversity represented at every level of the organization? Is there age and gender representation at every level of the organization? When it comes to your, your team, who dominates the decision making? Is it always white males? Whose voices are heard? Is it always the older, more senior people in the organization? And who controls where the money is invested? Is the work of racially diverse people and people in general who are different, is it rewarded and recognized the same as if it were a 50-something year old white male? And whose cultural perspective is represented? These are questions I would ask whether you're planning to roll out DEI training or not, just to kind of assess the temperature of your organization and how effective you will be when you start saying we want to have a, a more inclusive, more diverse culture. Asking yourself these questions will help you get at some of the concerns that may exist regardless of whether you roll out a big training plan or not. We have to move past the intention rhetoric, saying what we hope will happen and we intend to happen and start actually doing something because bias and discrimination and prejudice don't require intent to thrive. They thrive in, in, in places where people don't really want to address what's happening. They live and breathe through the marginalization of people with and without intent because they become ingrained in our culture and our way of thinking and our way of doing and being. And sometimes it's so ingrained we hardly ever notice. So it's important to take an assessment of your organization, ask some questions, talk to the people who work there and really find out what the experience of people who aren't in the majority in terms of their numbers and their perspectives. What are they thinking? What are they experiencing? And then when it comes to training, you, you have to start with the end in mind. What, what are you trying to do? What's the goal? What do you want people to leave your training session for the day or your training program? What do you want them to leave with? How do you want them to think? How do you want them to be? What do you want them to do as a result of having gone through training? If you can't answer those questions, then it's probably that you're just checking a box to say, yep, we did our unconscious bias training for the year, or yep, we did our, our compliance-based anti-harassment training for the year. And if that's all you're doing, then kind of the rest of this conversation may not matter to you. But if you're saying, I want to really see behaviors change, I want to see our culture change, I want to see um, our organization look more like society, then we can start to figure out how, what kind of skills we need to build in our people, what kind of behaviors we want to see, and design training and culture around those things. So 
Again, some questions I think you want to ask right off the bat. What is your own DEI training look like? How satisfied are you with your current execution of DEI training? Um, again, some organizations have some basic intro to DEI. They do their training either through onboarding or they do it once a year to make sure they're covered. And then they don't really talk about it anymore. Is that the case with you? Or have you built structures and programs and behavior standards around what you want to see so that people are actually being held accountable to some um, inclusive behaviors? How can you tell or how can you measure if it's imp impacting DEI awareness or behavior in your organization? So do you have any metrics in place? Are you looking at numbers of people who attended, feedback on training sessions? Are you doing an annual survey or a pulse survey? How are you measuring? Are you measuring um, the number of complaints that are being levied against your organization? What are the measures that you have to tell whether you're doing better? What vehicles does your organization use for training? Are you using in-person, self-study, webinar, virtual e-learning, combination, book studies, discussions, town halls? What's happening? What are you currently doing? What, could you, what more could you be doing? And then who receives DEI training? Is it for everyone? Is it just for high potential? Is it just for executives? Or is it for people who you think have a problem? Where are you trying to go with the training? And then do you have a best practice or innovation around DEI training at your organization? If you do, then that would, that's a great thing and a great way to start some of this work. So think about um, what creative ways you've come, come across to deliver training. Is it always people from your training department? Are you bringing in people from the outside? Or do you have a really great DEI team that's creating content and pushing it out to people? Are you using your newsletters, um, chat rooms, text messaging, website? How are you, what are you doing that's creative? Um, how are you coming up with different ways to deliver training? So again, these are some questions to think about with regard to your own organization. When it comes to DEI best practices and strategies, there's the first um, level of training, which is really awareness-based, and I kind of alluded to that earlier. It's um, a common way to start to get people thinking about diversity, it sensitizes them to their environment, things they may not have thought about before and now they may see as a result of having gone to this training. And this is your opportunity to message why diversity, equity, and inclusion are important to your particular organization and then to the business community or society overall. It's a way to help draw attention to your employee base and how they may have their own biases or blind spots or prejudices and it helps you have the opportunity to focus them on what their cultural assumptions are about people we all have them we just may not think about them awareness training gives you the, the opportunity to do that um, when you have awareness training you usually will have some case studies or some experiential exercises a way to help people experience a little piece of what it might be like to be in somebody else's shoes or just to analyze how they show up in the world and how they interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis. Another form of DEI training is skills-based training. And that really is about helping employees to become more proficient in handling the diversity that they come across in the workplace. So whether it is different personalities, different ways of thinking, languages, culture, race, ethnicity, gender, um, whatever it might be, uh, this skills-based training helps people to be able to improve, go out and take some action, do things differently. There are a lot of different tools that are elevated from the awareness stage to help people get to the proficiency stage when it comes to um, skills-based training. And the skills-based trainings are usually designed so people have something to take away, do practice, and become better at it. So the goal, the bottom line of skills-based training is to improve your interpretation of cross-cultural differences and um, understand different communication techniques with people from different cultures and be able to adapt better when you're in different situations. And then the last um, 
method would be to combine the, the two, to have an integration-based training that looks at awareness and skills-based approaches combined, and then has people work in close, close collaboration with others so they can really understand um, what the important context is for this training for your organization. People may be developing training uh, together uh, across departments or across teams in order to educate their workforce. And it can help people, um, it can help if you increase the frequency of your DEI training, do some, some awareness, some integrated or some integrated and some skills-based training so that you can beef up the way people learn in your organization and the opportunities they have to learn. And it provides a process or a framework for employees to constantly drop on and consciously drop on to build their skills in a day-to-day -day basis. So knowing that there is a progression of training from awareness to skills-based and then maybe some integration and coming back to awareness of a new topic and just integrating that on helps employees to feel better about the training when they know there's a process and there's a goal and a pathway in mind. And then at last, it helps people to see where diversity implications are overt and covert and implied. So again, just raising the knowledge and experiences of the people. So one of the things to think about when it comes to diversity training and actually improving culture is that it can't just be a one-time thing. It really has to become part of the fabric of what you do as an organization. Awareness and inclusion has to be part of the everyday workplace. You have to talk about it, think about it, um, in how you do your work, how you do the mainline business that you do, how it impacts clients, how it impacts the development of products and services. It should be part of everyday thinking, how you communicate internally and externally. And it should get to the point eventually where it's very fluid and you don't have to think about it, but it should be something that is um, just a normal part of your workplace culture. The second thing is to really be clear about your training goals, know what you're trying to do, um, know if it is awareness training or if it's compliance based because you have government contracts and you need to do certain trainings. If it's because you're, um, you know, if you have goals about number of attendance and how people learn, if you're checking the effectiveness of the learning, be sure that your goals are clear so that you can set up the appropriate uh, checks and balances in place. Make sure that you know what you want people to walk away from. If you're having, say, an unconscious bias training and you want people to be aware of their own biases, then you have to put a mechanism in there, either during the training for people to uncover their biases or homework for them to be able to uncover what their biases are. And then if you want them to really grow in that space, have some form of accountability afterwards, some way for them to check in and really be held accountable for their progress in that area. Um, choosing materials that have pre and post tests so that you can help measure goals and success is, is, is one way to go. Um, you can have a pre-test on what people know about a certain topic beforehand and then what they have learned on the back end. That's a good way to measure your goals. Make sure the training is supported from all levels. You want the messaging to be clear in your organization from the top to the bottom that it's important. So having executive sponsorship, executive voice and communication on these training matters, executive presence in the training is really important. And then making sure that everyone who is part of your team, um, that leadership are telling their peers about this training, they're holding each other accountable to going, communicating why it's important to the organization, that's super important to have successful training initiatives. Then aim for respectful and tolerant behavior, um, making sure that you promote effective, productive teamwork, that you diminish or eliminate any barriers to teamwork. That is just a, a best practice. You want people to treat one another with respect. If you don't have that in the office or the work environment you're in, you're probably not having a great training environment or a good culture. You want to make sure you get the right materials for your audience. There's a wide range of information out there, different ways to teach it, whether it's video, games, exercises, activities, reflections, uh, writing prompts, um, discussion prompts. 
things, make sure that you're addressing the needs of people who are differently able, that you have the right um, supports for people to be able to hear and see and experience all that the training is engaged, is, is intended to do, and make sure that you're, you're supporting everyone who might be able, that it's accessible for everyone who would want to take it. And then be engaging. There are a lot of different ways to connect with audiences. I think we've gotten a little bit more creative um, when it comes to our virtual environments, thinking about having polls, having breakout rooms, um, pre and post activities, but be creative in how you deliver your training. Think about any kind of way to get people to interact. There are interactive games you can do in person and virtually. Um, look for team activities. And then have a post-assessment. Make sure you're evaluating the training in some way to know how to improve it, to know if it was effective. Um, be flexible in how you deliver your training. And make sure that you're looking at the results of your assessment so that you can make each training experience going forward a little bit better. One thing that I didn't put in here, which I think is good advice, is think about team training so that it's not just one person, but you're getting people from different backgrounds who lead the training so that they can share their different stories and different experiences. So again, your employees really um, get to experience, even in the learning process, they're experiencing some diversity in terms of how it's presented. Um, think about diversity events. There's easy, less threatening ways to do diversity by having organization-wide awarenesses. So a lot of people will do that through calendars, and holidays, and um, celebrating cultural events. So that's one way to do that. Um, plan that for your organization. Think about um, what months, what weeks you're going to celebrate and do a year-long planning. Get everybody, as many people as want to be involved, get them involved in planning those events out. And make sure that for your diverse groups of people, however they might be diverse, make sure that they're included in that planning process because events are a great way to provide education. I don't know that people always think about them that way. I think we think about them as fun, but they're also very educational and an opportunity not to be missed when it comes to training and development. Um, know that diversity is more than just cultural facts. So present more than just the stats about what's different from person to person. Try to un, um, present opportunities for people to experience some of the cultures, the customs, the rituals. Um, that all helps with raising awareness. It increases people's cultural fluency, so it's important to understand. And then the tenth one is just to be patient. Know that when it comes to shifting culture, especially around diversity, equity, and inclusion, that it takes time. People don't turn on a dime and all of a sudden, poof, we're more aware, we're more skilled. It, uh, diversity, the thoughts and opinions and beliefs that we have about one another based on our differences have been ingrained in us since the time we were born. So to expect that your organization is going to undo 25, 35, 50 years of indoctrination from society and family and friends in that you're going to undo that over overnight or over a year or even over two or three or ten is um, not realistic. So I think where people really want to change and they're really passionate about this, it'll happen more quickly. But where people are, um, they don't understand or this hasn't been their life experience or this is new to them or they flat out don't want to do it, it's going to take a bit of time. And as you're trying to shift culture, you have to be patient. You have to meet people where they are. You have to learn how to accept that there are some people's minds you're not going to change. And that's OK, because we're talking about inclusion. Um, we have to recognize that um, it's sometimes it's heart change, and it's emotional. And it's, it's tough work, but we want to, just like we want people to have an open mind and listen, we also want to have an open mind and be patient and walk with people through this as best we can. Explaining why, being clear, repeating the message, but recognizing it can take a while. Um, when our organizations start to see significant change, I think that's when you start to see the benefit. You'll start to see 
um, people engaging in different ways. You'll see conversations change. You'll see teams meld together better. And that'll be the relational piece. But ultimately, you'll probably see where you will be more efficient in problem solving. You'll see that you're more creative and that you're reaching a broader audience with your product or your service, which will in turn result in better financial performance. So make sure your diversity training isn't just these one-off um, annual occasional or mandated events. Make sure that you're really thinking about how to embed DEI into your culture, how to make it interesting and exciting, how to engage as many people in it as possible. Think about your affinity groups or your employee resource groups. Think about your mentorship and sponsorship programs. What does it look like when you're developing people from different backgrounds? What your recruiting processes and your retention processes are like? All of that helps to shape culture and to shape the experiences of people who come from non-majority backgrounds in your organization. So what do employees want? There's been a lot of research that looks at what's important to employees when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And one of the main things that has been said is that um, employees want to explore, they want to have DEI be part of regular organization-wide discussions that every employee can engage in. So what I have seen in my um, career doing this work is that there's a shift away from lectures, um, not completely away, but a shift uh, less of an emphasis on let's just go to this room and listen to someone talk. People want to have the opportunity to, to talk about it. They want to talk about the hard issues. They want to talk about what's happening in society and how it's affecting them as a person individually, how it's affected their family. They want to talk about how it feels for them to come to work when all around them life is exploding um, figuratively. And they want to be able to hear from everyone, not just people who are um, super, super traumatized, but they want to hear from people who have a whole different life experience and they want to be able to engage around the hard tops, topics. And so that's, that's a big shift over the last year and a half, two years. And I don't know whether it's driven by um, COVID-19 and people not having enough human interaction or whether COVID-19 provided a pause for people to spend more time um, virtually talking and getting to know each other, whether it gave opportunity for us to slow down and really think about some of these issues and how it impacts us. Or if it was, I know part of it was George Floyd, um, seeing what happened to him for many people in the nation for the first time, seeing that kind of violence and um, discrimination happen with their own eyes was very traumatizing for people. And they, they want to process it, they want to understand. And real understanding doesn't happen in the vacuum. So we want to engage with one another. So that's one of the shifts. Um, employees want a culture of conversation and learning that yields the most sought after DEI competencies among employees from entry level to executives. So employees are telling me that they're tired of some executive or supervisor telling them to go to the training. They want for their leadership to understand all the nuances of DEI. They want their leadership to process what, it, what it's like to operate in their privilege, but also understand what it's like to operate in, in spaces where they don't have privilege, what it's like to for their employees who don't have the same life experiences that they do. They want to talk about it with the executives, but they also want to be sure that executives and supervisors and team leaders understand what the everyday experience is like for their entry level employees. So that's another shift. And then employees are wanting to come to a place where they are psychologically safe. So they don't want to have to hide what it is that they're doing. They don't want to have to um, to be concerned that what they're saying and what they're experiencing is going to be a source of um, contention or going to be a source of um, them being disciplined, but they want to process and talk about it and understand what it's like for, for people to be part of 
these various different groups and just they want to have these opportunities to converse. So different, it's a little bit different of a shift than what we've seen in the past where we just go and we listen or we go and we sit in front of the computer screen and click from page to page without really thinking about it, without processing with people. One of the things that also comes up is this idea of core competencies. Um, when we talk about that related to DEI, it's not a whole lot different from core competencies for, from your other job. It means that you have the skills and the knowledge and the abilities and the behaviors that um, describe or exhibit a certain standard of proficiency when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, just like you would if you were fixing computers or you were changing tires, you have to know how to do it. And the same is true with DEI. People want to know how to talk about it. They want to understand the terms and they want to feel that they're competent at doing it. Um, employees want to feel empowered they want to have a better appreciation for the shared experiences of difference and the shared experiences of respect and the shared need to belong and feel appreciated. We all have those needs. It's not just people who are um, in minority categories. Everyone has a need to feel respected and have a sense of belonging. We want to empower employees to create more respectful and inclusive workplaces. So, it shouldn't be that you have to go get approval to create more um, inclusion in your workplace. People need to feel empowered to do that right where they are. So in their own team, with their own boss, feel like they can ask for respect, that they can give respect, that they can treat people in the way that they want to be treated. So one of the other pieces is this whole town hall effect. With the increase of remote workers, we have seen a lot more town hall discussions. I think it, I don't know, maybe the, the Zoom and Teams and all these other virtual platforms created more opportunities for um, executive leaders to gather everyone easily and have these discussions. And I've been a part of really powerful um, discussions with executives and their teams. And I'm talking, you know, hundreds of people on a Zoom call where executives have gotten really vulnerable and shared um, from their personal lives, shared about how they really didn't understand or realize what their employees were going through, very transparent moments, hard moments, um, and then had the opportunity to be asked really hard questions from their employees and hear the stories and the experiences and that has had a huge impact on belonging at some organizations, um, especially for employees of color um, and people who've been impacted by COVID over the last year. People have really leaned in, executives have leaned in and have been really authentic in um, coming together with their employees to explore these topics. So that's been a, a new trend and it's been helpful in a lot of organizations. And then, um, we've taken conversations where, where we used to say, let's have an ERG or an employee resource group. And we want to have people just go into our private meetings with our ERG. We unpack and process all of the things that have gone on in our workplaces and in our lives. And that's become our safe space. Now we're seeing ERG say, no, we want this to be part of our whole organization's discussion. We want to have conversations with employees, managers, executives. We want everyone to engage in. It's not just us who are going through this. And when we go through something and we come to work, it affects everyone who we encounter. So let's talk about it from whether it's people of color, it's the LGBTQ community, it's people who've lost folks from COVID, it's people who are um, differently abled, people who have different personality types. Everybody is kind of leaning in more to engage in these conversations and it's helping a lot of workplaces um, create a better sense of belonging. Some of the hot topics that are cropping up in the DEI space, which you may not always think about, are empathy and respect and civility. Those are top of mind topics lately. I think because if we go all the way back to probably 2013, 14, 15, think about the climate in the country, um, elections that were coming up, and all that has transpired since that time, 
um, we've seen kind of a decline in people treating each other with goodwill and respect. And so there's a need to talk about it, to talk about what it looks like, um, how we feel when someone disrespects us, to try to empathize with people who have gone through difficult times, whether it is you know an encounter with the police gone wrong, family members who have died from illness, people who've been shot in nightclubs, whatever it might be, there's this leaning in and really a need that um, HR and DEI people are seeing that we've, we're being asked to do more empathy, respect, civility, emotional intelligence, how to appreciate my coworkers or my employees. So all of those are happening. Allyship is another big uh, DEI training topic that um, a lot of organizations are talking about and working with employees on. And then my, disrupting microaggressions, another huge topic area. And again, I think just because of the way society has gone, people are saying we need to treat each other better. We need to use better language, better actions, better behaviors to create these inclusive environments. So for 2021 and beyond, I think there's still gonna be a focus on equity. People are still grappling with what, what does equity mean? Does it mean everyone gets the same thing at the same time in the same amount, regardless of who they are? Or does it mean that everyone gets what they need in order to be successful? And I would say it's the latter. Um, whatever the situation, whether it's in public schools, whether it's um, in your private organization, your private company, your nonprofit, you're thinking about how can we best support employees and give them the thing that they need in order to be successful in their jobs or their function within our team. And I think we're just going to see more and more um, training requests in this equity space. Um, and again, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, the terms are so closely linked that you can't talk about diversity without talking about equity, without talking about inclusion. And for me, inclusion is kind of where we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to a place where people are in spaces where they're comfortable, they're competent, they're thriving, and where relationships are working. And if you're not treating people with equity and you don't have very much diversity, you probably truly haven't gotten to an inclusive place. So some other things that are happening are discussions, just discussions to help employees meet um, their objectives around empathy, respect, and cultivating an allyship mindset or a culture, ally culture in the organization. So don't think again that you're not going to talk about it. If your organization is really trying to move to a place of um, higher inclusion, deep, more deeply embedding equity, it's going to take a lot of conversations, conversations between you and your supervisor, you and your peers, executives to their whole workforce. And it's going to take conversations that are touchy, um, some that may make you really angry, some that may make you cry, some that will make you laugh, some that will give you joy because you actually connected with someone and understood their point of view and they got you. All of that's going to happen. It's going to be a mixed bag, but the discussions are necessary. And we have to be able to have them with an attitude of empathy and respect and trust. And then organizations are going to need to think about how to have these discussions. Um, discussions by themselves are great, are, are not, they're not complete. So discussions, some, most, many times we'll have discussions and they'll leave um, a lot of stuff on the table where we'll have um, an issue that comes up, it'll get a lot of energy around it and then it's just left out there. So we want to be able to have discussions where um, we can continue to explore issues that come up. We can do that in the context of training and really get grounded in what the terms mean, how we're defining them for our organization, what behaviors we want to see based on the values that we have in our diversity, equity, and inclusion statements, our anti-racism statements, whatever those are, that you're aligning people up underneath your organizational values with behavior standards so everybody knows what the, the ground rules and the, the course of action is. 
So with dialogues, um, there's this focus on key concepts, DEI concepts that shape the world and inform the values and practical strategies for every employee and leader to use in order to create a culture of belonging. Know that DEI does differ from other training. Um, as I've said, it involves our, our, our emotions, our intellect. Sometimes it's very visceral and physical because it challenges your worldview. It challenges how you grew up. It challenges what your mother, your father, your aunt or uncle or your grandparents told you. It challenges what you learned in school from your teachers and from your coaches. And it challenges the way of life from whether it was you grew up in a small town in the middle of Iowa or you grew up in the inner city of Chicago. It challenges what you grew up believing. And sometimes that can be really um, reactionary, highly charged. So it's hard. It's not for the faint at heart. And with that, I think you that's one of the reasons why it's really critical for organizations to have sat down and thought about what their overarching vision, mission, goals, and strategy is related to DEI. Because at the end of the day, if you are part of an organization, a business, a team, your values become your true north. So regardless of how I was raised, if belonging is where we're trying to go, if diversity and equity and inclusion are where we're trying to go, then I'm looking at those values and expecting everyone from the senior leader on down to operate on those values and have behavior standards that back that up. Some of the challenges that we see related to diversity, equity, and inclusion come from having unclear expectations. Again, people come into DEI training with all of their stuff. And if we aren't clear about what, what the objectives are, not just in our own head, but articulating them clearly to the people who come to the training, messaging before they go, during the training, and after the training, then we lose some of the power of the training because people walk out and they, they have all these notions. I'm just here because they're making me. I'm here because of affirmative action. I'm here because you know they're marginalizing me as somebody who's white in our culture. They don't like baby boomers, so all we have to hear about is millennials. So people walk out with these subconscious messages. So in order to um, mitigate that, be clear about what your expectations are. Um, make sure that you change, uh, that there's changes that are, that are based on people's individual perspectives. So again, the clearer you are in communicating the purpose for the, the training and what, you, what behaviors you expect people to exhibit. So no matter what you say, people need to know what you want them to do. So be clear. Um, there are competing forces in, in change making. So sometimes um, leaders, senior leaders, executives, the CEO or the C-suite of your organization or the executive director may say, this is the direction we're going in with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But the managers and supervisors are not on board. So they're communicating either indifference or a totally opposite direction. And that's very com confusing for um, employees. Uh, it can also be include, uh, create confusion when the, the executives are not on the same page. So making sure that everyone is aligned and understands the direction is, is critical. Um, also, just coming up with some random training or buying some training off the shelf and making and and not really again incorporating the reasons why and getting buy-in from people when thinking about where your training process is going to be that can also be harmful. So you want to make sure that you do get the um, buy-in from uh, as many people as possible when you're coming up with your training programs. And then if you do some training without thinking about what the organizational culture is that also can be very problematic. So you wanna make sure that um, the culture is understood before you plan the training. So think about the types of people, the jobs that they have, when you're gonna schedule the training, all of that needs to be considered. Organizations that fail to achieve good results from their training um, usually don't have training very much beyond the awareness level. 
they do a couple of things to say, here's what diversity is, here's what unconscious is, unconscious bias is, and that's it. They haven't really required anything else from people. They haven't conducted an initial needs assessment. They haven't looked at the organization to say, where are we now today? What are we trying to develop in people? What, are, what do we want to see in terms of a direction for our employees? And so when they don't do that, then sometimes the training misses the mark. They have no evaluations of training, so they don't know whether their trainers were effective, whether the content was resonated with people. Um, so ask those questions. And they haven't got a strong enough executive buy-in. So it does no good for the HR team or the DEI person to offer training, and the executives really aren't supporting it because people won't go and people won't be held accountable. Some of the training barriers that crop up is if you have people who are unskilled at talking about DEI. I've talked to a lot of folks who want to train in DEI of all different backgrounds and they just, some of them don't prepare. It requires you to be transparent um, sometimes and tell your own stories. It requires you to be good at um, engaging people, at listening, as well as facilitating and presenting. So make sure that your trainers are skilled in that area. Um, when your trainers get to the place where they're talking about their own psychological issues and affiliation and all of that, if they insert too much of themselves, that's not a good thing either. Um, if they have a political agenda, that can be problematic. If it's not integrated into the overall DEI approach for your organization, also a problem. If it's um, too short, too late, or too reactive to a bad situation, um, that can be problematic. Everybody knows when the company gets in trouble for harassment and now all of a sudden we have to have harassment training. That seems like a knee-jerk reaction. Um, when people were coming out with all of these anti-racism and DEI statements after George Floyd was killed, in some cases that seemed like a knee-jerk reaction because they had never done anything in DEI before, they never talked about it, they just came out and made a statement and there was nothing to back it up. So consider that. Um, when training isn't clear about what it's trying to address, whether it is DEI, affirmative action, communicating across cultures, whatever it might be, if that's not clear to people, that also is a barrier or a miss on the part of whoever's planning the training. So some of the ways to think about overcoming this is to communicate your business case. Um, sit down, assess your organization, and talk about why it's important for your particular organization to engage in DEI um, training, DEI culture change, whatever you're trying to do. Be transparent and tell the truth about what's happening in your organization. Um, experiential training focused on behaviors is always going to be better than just a lecture. Um, having people really process you know, what's happening, asking them questions, getting them to um, engage in activities will be a good addition to your training. Have some clear metrics about where you're trying to go. Again, um, whether if it's just attendance, if that's one metric, but you want to go deeper than that, you want to actually see some tangible results. So examine your organization and think about that. Tell employees to practice what they learn, catch people doing something inclusive and recognize them for it. And really don't expect the training to be the cure-all for everything that goes wrong. If you have a toxic culture just because you had a training doesn't mean it's going to go away. There's work that has to be done beyond that. Um, help people to, to understand, you know, engage their sense of fair play and equity. Talk about what that means and how you're trying to support them. Have a clear call to action. So what do you want them to do having walked away from this training? So what I'm hoping you'll do when you walk away from this training is um, really analyze your organization and think about the, the steps you need to take to develop a robust training program, what resources you need, who needs to be involved, um, what kind of assessment you need to do for your organization. Think about whether you're going to do, whether you're at the awareness stage or you're at the skills building stage. Think about who needs to help you do this work and what kind of behavior change you want to see in your organization, to name a few. Um, Use the training to learn from employees. Many times, if you're willing to listen, employees will, will tell you everything you need to know about the culture. And they'll also, a lot of times, tell you ways to fix it. So it's not rocket science. It's, it's asking questions and being able to listen and act on it. 
and then emphasize this mentoring and coaching um, even through employee networks. And I will tell you for your underrepresented people, you also need to look at sponsorship. Sponsorship is key to getting um, those people developed, uh, whoever they might be, whether it's younger people, people with disabilities, people of color, um, LGBTQ folks, women, whoever. If you're expecting to get them to the next level, up to executive levels in your organization, it will not happen without sponsorship. So take that seriously. Um, allocate resources to team building. So, and allocate resources to DEI overall. You're not gonna hire one DEI person, expect them to, to fix years and years of problems in your organization all by themselves with no staff, no budget. So resource your team building and resource your DEI efforts. To create some effective training, you have to have this infrastructure. Um, no, talk about how it relates to your strategy. strategy. Um, make sure your programs are inclusive and that um, they're accessible. Have some flexibility. Make sure you're catering to whatever your internal needs are. Have some train the trainer session. So even if you hire an outside consultant, um, ask them to train people internal to your your workforce so that you can redo these trainings as more people join your organization and you're developing a skill for people on your teams as well. Make sure that senior management is involved. Um, the training isn't just for employees, it's for leadership as well. And make sure all employees come and train your business units together if you can. It's really nice when a whole team can come together and process um, their own interactions uh, even come up with some, I call them codes of conduct or co civility codes on how they're going to treat each other respectfully. That's gr a great activity to do coming out of some DEI trainings. And make sure that the environment is safe. Um, when people are sharing in these training sessions, you have to create space for it to be um, confidential. And at the same time, allow people to feel comfortable saying what they need to say. I talked about ground rules, make sure that you set those, co-facilitate sessions whenever you can, try to have your attendance be as diverse as possible, establish some action plans, some follow-up, accountability, and assess and have a working knowledge of your organization and its culture. If you're leading this training internally, it's really helpful um, that you really understand the culture, not just of your team, but the organization overall, so that you know how to tailor what you're saying to each department, team, um, function, and so forth. Have trainers who, edit, who are adept at navigating volatile situations. I just worked with an organization that hadn't really thought about that, and most, most teams don't. So they'll have a situation where someone vehemently disagrees with something that is said, and I don't know, it doesn't go well. Uh, uh, tempers flare, things are said, and if your trainers or facilitators are not prepared to handle those discussions, it can make your diversity and inclusion efforts worse than where they were to begin with. So having people who are level-headed, who are able to defuse situations, um, who don't get you know, rattled when um, emotions are high is helpful and that you actually practice scenarios and language. What would you do if this happened in the middle of your training? All of that is good to do. And um, just understand that, again, this is very sensitive work and emotions are involved, history is involved. Sometimes people have had some real serious trauma around um, their identity and it, it comes to surface again in the middle of trainings and so you can't you can't lose your temper as a trainer or a facilitator. You have to be able to um, walk people through some situations and handle it um, respectfully. So that's why, too, it's also good to have a co-facilitator if you can. Have a needs assessment. We talked about assessment already. Um, linking your DEI strategy to business results is always key. You're going to have people who are engaged because of the moral and societal reasons for doing um, diversity training and, and diversity work. But then you're also gonna have those people who will say, if it's not going to help 
our, our business or our bottom line, then why are we doing it? So make sure when it comes to your business case that you have worked through all the, the reasons why it's important. We talked about learning from employees and all that good stuff. Um, pay attention to diversity of thought. We, we talk about personality type a little bit when it comes to diversity. We could talk about that more because it does matter. But how people process um, is also important. What people think, what they've experienced is important. So look beyond just the demographic um, diversity of age, gender, identity, racial identity, ethnic identity, and all of that. But think about the things that we can't see. There's a lot more diversity we cannot see about people that we need to consider. And then um, incorporate the metrics and evaluation. So some, the last few things I want to leave you with have to do with executive leader best practices. And some of these I co-opted from the CEO um, diversity action plan or pledge. So these things I think are key to think about for leaders, if any of you are leaders and you're thinking about what you want to do in this space with this work. Um, here's a few thoughts. So make workplaces trusting places to have complex and sometimes difficult conversations about DEI. So you want to have environments and platforms where people feel comfortable. If you've been really overbearing as a leader and people are afraid of you, they're probably not going to share. You're not going to have this um, revealing of their life experiences and these authentic conversations. Make sure that you think about ongoing dialogue with people. Um, talk about how much you value openness and building relationships. That's going to be key. Build trust, encourage compassion, open-mindedness. Make sure that you over and over reiterate your commitment to an inclusive culture. Um, implement and expand unconscious bias education. Again, um, the, the very basic awareness of what is unconscious bias, that's one training. But then going deeper to say, where does unconscious bias show up in our teams? How do I exhibit unconscious bias in my decision making? What can I do to overcome unconscious bias? That might be some skills-based training that could be deepened. Um, we know that everyone has biases. We need to be taught how to recognize and minimize the impact of our um, unconscious biases. And then commit to expanding the education. Look at your organizational culture. Figure out how you can work in more opportunities to think about that. And then help people minimize their blind spots by having more conversations and more opportunities to challenge and help people to grow. Share best and unsuccessful practices. There are a lot of things we do that just do not work. We don't like to talk about them, but I think it's helpful to revisit those and maybe even say, what could we have done differently and how can we make this better? So think about um, your programs and initiatives around DEI. Help your own organization and people to grow as they think about their strategies. Help them to share what went wrong and what, what went really well. Help them to do that internally as well as externally um, with other organizations so that we create a community of best practice when it comes to DEI. Um, create and, sh and share strategic DEI plans with board members. Um, board, I've been doing a lot of work with boards lately and they're thinking about this too. And if you want them to be able to advise and govern appropriately, if DEI is important to the organization, then you ought to be sharing that information with them. So they're thinking about it when it comes to strategy and um, ways to, to prioritize and, and build accountability in the team. It helps them to um, drive the strategy that helps your organization succeed. And um, it helps them when they're thinking about the actions that they want to take when it comes to creating a culture of inclusive talent in the organization. And then create an accountability system to track progress and share regular updates. So that's, I, I keep talking about measurements. I think it's important. I'm one of these who thinks that you get what you measure. So I think um, having that piece in place to hold people accountable for this, it's nice. It's one thing to talk about all this diversity work and to talk about having a great culture, but if we aren't um, in some way figuring out how we're gonna measure our success, how we're gonna 
hold people accountable, then it really doesn't do any good. It's all just talk. So how we learn together, how we have um, established commitments and better serve society, I think is important for us to do. Um, make good on the promises that people should be able to bring their best selves to work. I, if I've heard that one time, I've heard it a thousand over the last two years. And so we need to stop talking about it and actually put it into place. Uh, work together towards diversity, equity, and inclusion with, uh, with our workplaces and industries and the broader business community. We have to be able to, to do that as well. And then cultivate meaningful change for our society. So with that, I'm at the place where I'm ready to take some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I don't see anything in here right now, but um, certainly let me know. Oh, there they are. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm looking, is it possible to get copies of the slides? So I will send a handout to Andy and he will be able to um, get them to you. I'll also put my, um, well, Andy can put my email address into the chat and you could email me and I can send them to you as well. Um, do you, Kathleen Callan says, do you have recommendations for accessible training resources and materials, specifically looking for materials that can be addressed by those who are blind and visually impaired? So much that is out there is visual without audio descriptions or printed materials um, that aren't tagged with compatible screen readers. That is true. That's an industry um, issue across the board. I have been hearing a lot of uh, about a lot of work that's being done to make this more accessible, especially um, online. What I can do, I don't have the name off the top of my head, but I do have a resource that um, works specifically with accessible training for DEI. So Kathleen, if you email me, I'll dig that up and send it to you. The other place I would check would be SHRM, because I know that's a big issue with, with them. I would email them directly and ask for resources that they may have as well. Um, El Elisa says, do you have any advice for how an organization can decide which DEI professional or training organization can best fill their needs and goals? So uh, um, you can ask for referrals for people who um, other companies, other HR or DEI folks that you respect, ask them for their referrals about who would be um, good. Uh, of course, I would recommend my company. There are several organizations locally. So if you email me, I can send you some of the names of those people. If you're in the Madison area, I don't know if you are. Um, also, there are a couple of um, other organizations that are more national that I could point you in the direction of. There are a lot of consulting companies who are very large, like Deloitte and PwC and a couple of others who do a lot of training. Um, I know of a few in the Chicago area as well, so I can send you what I know of. Um, but in terms of how to decide, I think what I would do is line up or write down what your goals and objectives for the trainings are, and then when you and what what um, what outcomes you want to have, and then talk to the trainers um, or companies to see if they can meet those outcomes. And if they can, then they're probably a good source for you. And if not, then move on to the next one. But I would also ask for um, references. If you really want to be sure, ask for references from um, other companies who've used their services. Uh, Becky says, recommend resources, training opportunities in resource limited environment. So there's a ton of free stuff available on the internet. If you Google unconscious bias or microaggression or any number of things, there are a lot of other nonprofits who have deep resources, training resources um, that you can utilize to do that training. Um, I myself do a number of pro bono trainings per year. I pick my number. It's usually 10 or 12 a year. And I do them until that till I hit my number, and then I'm done. And I know a lot of organizations offer um, discounts to nonprofits, but 
I, I kid you not, there's a lot of free stuff on the on the internet if you want to do it internally. And then there are, um, I can send you my list. I have a list of podcasts, books, and videos that you can look at depending on the topic. But there's resources you can put together to read through, to listen to, um, to have discussions about on your own. Plenty of those. Um, can you speak to metrics data collection for those types of diversity that don't relate to visible demographics. So when it comes to some of those, you'll have to do some um, assessments. I would say um, most organizations will do some sort of either focus group interviews or an online computer aided assessment where they will ask questions in whatever those um, diversity characteristics are that are not visible. So you would have to come up with your list and then create um, questions to ask. And that becomes their qualitative measure. The other thing that you can do is pay attention to the quant, uh, I'm sorry, that becomes a quantitative measure. But you can also find out, don't discount, I would say, quantitative data, um, the conversations that you're having with people on a day-to-day -day basis that leaders are having where somebody comes up and expresses how, how they were made to feel or a, an experience that they had, that's really good data. So make sure that you are um, collecting all of the, the qualitative things that happen. Um, having focus groups is a really great way if there's a particular um, set of uh, non-visible diversity characteristics that you want to identify and talk to people about. Um, if you're looking for people who have a, a particular background or people who might work in a particular department, you want to know what their experience of a situation is. Focus groups are, are really great for that too. Um, would you suggest making DEI conversations mandatory to ensure that those currently unengaged are present in these conversations? Um, that's a tough one. I would say when it comes to um, training, there are some trainings that I would make mandatory, like um, I would make anti-harassment training mandatory. I would make uh, probably unconscious bias and microaggression and um, anything where you're talking about your business case or your rationale for why diversity, equity, and inclusion matters for your organization, I would make all those mandatory because you want people to have at least a foundational knowledge of what you're doing and where you're trying to go. When it comes to conversations, um, that can be tricky because some people are just not going to, they're, they're either going to tune out or they may be just really disgruntled and making them come just so that they can hear what other people have to say or what other people have gone through may be more counterproductive. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish by, by with the conversation, I guess. So without knowing that, I would say you have to take that on a case by case basis. For those of you who have put your um, email addresses in the chat, Andrew, I'm going to ask that you capture those for me. Otherwise, I'll lose those. So I would say it would be better for you to email me and say you want it than leave it in the chat because I, I won't have access to that. Just a, just a thought. Um, let's see. Linda says, I'm concerned that many organizations only pay lip service to DEI training. What should I look out for if I feel that no one is taking it seriously? Um, one of the things, if there's no strategic plan, that's a clue that it's not being taken all that seriously. If there are no resources allocated towards it, financial or people um, resources, that's another indication that it's probably not being taken as seriously. Unless, unless the organization is just starting out, then they may have to wait a budget cycle before they do that. If you don't have um, senior leaders, and I'm talking CEO and whatever your highest level leaders are. If they aren't talking about this and haven't made a public or verbal commitment to this, that's an indication they aren't taking it seriously. If they have not, if it's not represented in your values or your vision and mission statements, that's another um, indication that it's not being taken seriously. Um, if supervisors, if no one's ever being held accountable for it, no one's tasked or responsible with the work, that's another clue. 
So all of all of those things are big red flags for me when I go into organizations on a consulting basis. If they're just bringing me in to check off a box and do a training, it, that's pretty clear right off the bat. Um, organizations who are serious have have done more work at the leadership level. So because they know they have to commit up front so that they can drive this, this attitude down. So that's some of the things that I would look for. I think I got all of the questions. Um, if there's something that comes up for anyone and you um, don't want to ask it here, you can again feel free to email me your questions and I'll, I'll make sure to answer those too. Otherwise, if there are no more questions, I think we're done. So I do thank you and appreciate you coming today too. Thanks so much for that, Debbie. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I will go ahead and send out those worksheets to everybody to the address that you use to register for this event. I think that'll be the most concise way. Um, with that being said, though, we'll go ahead and cap it there and we will see you all.